And now, an eighth special presentation. This time on Artbeat Nation, watch a contemporary painter who compares himself to a 100-meter dasher. That I think I painted the American River no less than hundreds of times. Take a walk on the Irish side. I really love the intimate setting. I have a lot of fun with the audience because I think it's nice to do that. Learn about the anti-hero of film noir. Director Howard Hawks caught lightning in a bottle when he discovered Lauren Bacall. And see a small town transformed. We've just progressively grown and reinvented ourselves year after year to become the largest Renaissance festival in the country. It's all ahead on Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. While most artists mix their different shades of paint on a palette, contemporary painter Jin Wang moves straight to the canvas. With thick oil paints, quick movements, and broad strokes, he's able to truly capture the emotion of the landscape before him in Carmichael, California. Take a look. Northern California is rich with cultural diversity and talent. And one of this area's brightest gems is hard at work behind me right now. Jim Wong, contemporary artist. Good to see you. Good to see you, Rob. Thank you for having us at your Carmichael home here. You're painting these beautiful oak trees here. It's my pleasure. It's amazing to see how quickly you work. I'm in awe of how fast this is. I consider myself like a 100 meter dancer <laughs> rather than the marathon runner. But, uh, after the initial uh, painting cover up the canvas, I would uh, very carefully to fix up uh, all the details. Touch-ups. The touch-ups. Yes. Which uh, the viewer may not see the correction that I had made so that it would uh, have harmony uh, to the whole canvas. Where do you find your inspiration today? You're painting these trees, but you also love the American River. Absolutely, that I think I painted the American River no less than hundreds of times. It's just beautiful, and your skies are so pretty. This, from the American River sky, I carry down all the different paintings, you know, even though this is uh, San Diego. Do you prefer painting nature? Uh, for me, I think any visual elements that is interesting to me. The nature, if you consider a setup of still life, and, uh, or the wonder of uh, a human face, and to me all, very inspirational. Now you came to the States in 1986 from China. Describe the type of painting that you do. It is contemporary, but how would you describe it to someone? I think a more uh, expressionistic a way of handling the painting surface, so, which means that the, you are not a mimic, mimic the nature, but uh, to express in your own individual way of what nature in your artistic uh, sense rather than uh, a pictorial sense. Most artists that working are pre-mixed the color on palettes and but what I did for my painting is most of the color were mixed the right on the canvas while I was working on the, the, the canvas. So which has the um, advantage of each color, each brush strokes that carried um, really multiple colors. So I see that your paint is very thick. How long does it take for these to dry? It takes about a half a year to completely dry. A half a year? Right. But the, the surface right in a couple of weeks okay. and there's no air coming into it because the back of the canvas is sealed. And so the paint actually is not dry, it's just a set. You must go through so much paint. Absolutely. And I use up maybe 600 tubes uh, 200 cc a year when they deliver it and they come with a lifter and a big pallet. A pallet? Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe a pallet to paint and a two pallet to canvases. That each brush stroke is alive. And, and when people once said like Jen's painting is never complete, it's always give you a, uh, a sense of lifeliness. Uh, life 
and uh, it's like he's still working on it. Do you ever get sad to see your paintings go? Not quite, because uh, I'm an artist that I have to live on. And secondly, that I always fantasize that the unfinished painting or the next painting will be a better one. Northern California have a such a rich season changing that visually it stimulates artists to make a great paintings. And that, for my opinion, explained it, why Northern California have very distinguished paintings. And even though I bring my painting to New York, uh, to Memphis or Atlanta, that I still believe the quality in Northern California is superb. How does your art inspire you? Actually, um, it was very much later on when the painting is completed and I able to enjoy them. But while I was working on a painting, very rarely that I have satisfaction of it. Really? Because I always uh, frustrated with the, uh, the better mind than what it showed on the canvas, what I did. And so I, very often that when I was looking back at the painting a few days later, I said, wow, it was not that bad. Why I was so <laughs> upset with myself when I was working on it. Well, whatever you're doing, you're doing right. And we certainly do enjoy your paintings and we love watching you at work. So I'd love to watch you do some more painting. Thank you All so right, much. Thank you, yes. Tim Long, here at your Carmichael home and studio. For more information, visit jinwangart.com. Next, we explore the Irish Arts Center in New York City. Founded in 1972, the Irish Arts Center encompasses a gallery, classrooms, and a performance venue that hosts intimate theater and music performances, film screenings, literary events, and more. Executive Director Aidan Connolly is joined by performer Julie Feeney to discuss this mecca for Irish arts and culture. Irish Arts Center is a multidisciplinary cultural center here on the west side of Manhattan. And we have three core elements to what we do. We have a performance program. We have an exhibition program. We also have an education program. In terms of our mission, uh, we really have a, a goal of projecting a dynamic image of Ireland and Irish America for the 21st century. Um, and we do that in a way that builds community with people of all backgrounds. Some of the programming that tells our story best, I think about a theater piece called Cambria Douglas. Two plays that we ran in rotating repertory. It was the Cambria that was written and performed by Donal O'Kelly about Frederick Douglass's historic trip to Ireland uh, aboard the paddleship steamer Cambria. And it was a little known story which turned out that Frederick Douglass shortly after the publication of his autobiography, while he was on the run um, and enraged slaveholders uh, chasing him, took refuge in Ireland and found common cause with people like Daniel O'Connell. We got together with Classical Theatre of Harlem and also worked with Roger Ginver Smith with his play Frederick Douglass Now, which was obviously the Douglass story from a more grounded African American perspective. Projects like that that give us a chance to project the excellence and the dynamism of contemporary Irish culture, but also find some connective tissue with other cultures, those are the best kinds of projects. We have a series called Masters in Collaboration where we bring uh, an artist from Ireland together with another artist, um, maybe from here in the States or maybe from somewhere else in the world, and give them an opportunity to collaborate for a week uh, without any real constraints about what it is that they're gonna come up with. We kind of expanded it and we offered Julie Feeney, a uh, really incredible uh, contemporary composer, singer, songwriter, musician, arranger, a month-long residency with a group of New York-based musicians. So we're really thrilled with that engagement. is a tricky thing And it brings you lightly Love is not what you think it should be And it sings to you rightly This is the first opportunity I've ever had to do 10 shows in a row and of course in New York City. As an artist, it's been incredible to work, to craft your... I really love the intimate setting. I have a lot of fun with the audience because I think it's nice to do that. I like to have some kind of eye contact as much as possible. 
So I love performing in a small theatre. It's the best ever. This show, I'm working with the director, Vallejo Gantner, from PS122. To have his vision permeate through my work as well has been really interesting. It's been a great fusion. I normally don't collaborate with people in that way, so this has been very, very rewarding. If I lose you tonight, my love, who will pass on the dispel and pen? Sadness behind your eyes with my love. Is there a crevice there to begin? Our programming is broken up uh, into a fall and a spring season in terms of our performance calendar. Usually we have a live theater offering that's over from Ireland. We recently had a wonderful play from Fishamble Theater Company in Dublin called Silent, which is written and performed by Pat Kinnevin about a homeless man who's transported through his affection for the films of Rudolph Valentino. We also have a live music component. Um, sometimes that'll be performers who are sort of on the scene in Ireland. Sometimes it's some of the really interesting work that's emerging out of here in the United States. Uh, for example, Mick Maloney's an artistic associate of ours, an incredible um, traditional music folklorist and performer. For the kind of work that needs a little bit more physical space than we currently have, we do a season of concerts up at Symphony Space. We also have a rich literature and humanities program where we have dozens of authors coming through over the course of the year. We also, despite the modesty of the space, put on a dance program. We've partnered with uh, Bershnikoff Art Center. We recently had a project called Out of Time featuring Colin Dunn. In addition to that, we've got a film series of contemporary films curated by our team here. Lots of documentaries, concert films, interesting stories that are hard to find. So there's always something going on. Our education program is really one of our most enduring elements with 35 classes per week uh, in Irish language, music, and dance. It's a very welcoming environment. You can come in simply with an interest for learning another language. But what's also great about it is that you can come and learn um, and then progress. So for example, we have five levels of fiddle. Some of the best traditional musicians who are coming through New York will stop by and give a master class. There's always an opportunity to have a, a really intimate educational experience and in an accessible environment so that people can tap into it simply if they have the interest. We also have the gallery where we project contemporary visual artists such as we have here today. And we also do cultural exhibitions that have tell the uh, Irish story and the Irish American story and we tour that. We commissioned an exhibition by the great portrait photographer John Minahan on the eldest Irish immigrants here in America, people who really represent the foundation upon which Irish America was built. We actually had the Prime Minister of Ireland open that for us here, and then we've toured it to the communities that it depicts. We still have a real connection to immigrant culture, and I think that having Irish culture uh, sort of connect with other immigrant cultures. Um, this is just a great place uh, for, for that to happen. I think the Irish Arts Centre really is a great outlet for contemporary Irish artists because you end up coming here in the mix with a lot of traditional artists. It definitely fosters the arts, there's no question about it. I'm really excited about the future of it, actually. I can't wait to see what kind of work they're going to be doing in, in a few years' time. It is a fantastic place to do a show. I've had the time of my life and I don't want it to end. For more information, visit irishartscenter.org.
Every few years, a new generation of cinema aficionados discovers the films of the anti-hero actor Humphrey Bogart. Key Largo, an island in Florida, is named after Bogart's movie Key Largo, and is now the site of the first annual movie festival celebrating film noir and Bogart's classics. First off, Humphrey Bogart had the good fortune to be in more than a handful of really great movies. You know, there's some wonderful actors who I love and old movie buffs care about, but they don't have the reputations uh, nowadays because the films haven't held up or the films aren't as well known. Bogart is, I think, very contemporary uh, for a lot of reasons, but he, he played anti-heroes. Uh, he didn't play pretty boys. He played uh, uh, men uh, with inner conflicts and uh, who questioned things, and uh, that's a very uh, fresh kind of idea that uh, still appeals to people today. The character of Rick in Casablanca is anything but a conventional Hollywood hero. That's the mother side goes. That's the original. My sister and I have been thinking about something like this for a number of years. Now is the right time, and, and Key Largo was jumped right in, uh, they threw everything they had at it, they were behind it 100%. Thanks everybody, uh, I'm just so happy to be here in Key Largo, um, and I'm so happy that all you guys are here, and you're so enthusiastic, and so nice, and uh, I know that you're going to enjoy the movie. Ten of my father's movies, uh, ten other movies, uh, everything from Double Indemnity and Chinatown and Sunset Boulevard, uh, to Drive, which is the Ryan Gosling movie. It's a noir festival, and uh, so all the movies are going to be based on that. Uh, a lot of different films, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, African Queen. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. There's a Casablanca Ball. Uh, Jack Houston's going to be down here uh, accepting uh, the Maltese Falcon Award on behalf of his grandfather. The move, where else, you know? You're not going to go to the to Africa. We could do the African Queen. But it, it was perfect. It's, it's a name that's well known. It's a name that people identify with. They made the song. And uh, it was one of my mother and father's finest films, uh, Houston, uh, Eddie Robinson. And, you know, it was just, it was the perfect place to do it. The, the town is named Key Largo because of the movie. They actually changed the name to Key Largo because it, it resonated so strongly from the 1948 movie that Bogart was in. And secondly, the African Queen is docked here. Uh, the co-star, you could say, of his wonderful movie with Katherine Hepburn. Uh, so there, there are two very strong, very real links to Bogart sitting right in front of us. Um, well, people ask me that, uh, I think either Key Largo or To Have and Have Not, because without To Have and Have Not, I would not be here. So I kind of like that one as well. Director Howard Hawks caught lightning in a bottle when he discovered Lauren Bacall and cast her opposite Bogart in To Have and Have Not. And uh, you, you just can't invent it. You can't create it. It's either there or it isn't there, and it was there. Well, my favorite film of all is Casablanca, uh, which I saw during a, uh, a Bogart revival in the late 60s. It, at that time, he was sort of rediscovered by a new generation. And I was one of the lucky ones who got to see that film for the first time in a movie theater. Not on TV, not on some form of home video, which came later, but in a theater, on a big screen, in the dark, the way it should be seen at its best. I hope it happens, I hope it happens every year, and I hope everybody comes down and has a good time, that everybody's happy with, with how it comes out. That's really all you can ask for the first one. To learn more, visit BogartFilmFestival.com. The small town of Todd Mission, Texas is an unlikely destination for a million visitors every fall, until you realize it's home to the Texas Renaissance Festival. 
reporter Ernie Manus recently had a chat with both the entertainment director and the king of the festival. Take a look. Over the past 38 years, the Texas Renaissance Festival has grown into the nation's most acclaimed Renaissance Fair, where the sights, sounds, tastes, and beauty of the 16th century come alive, featuring thousands of talented performers, artisans, craftspeople, and more. Joining me right now are... Jeff Baldwin. And Jeff, what do you do here? I'm the entertainment director here at the Texas Renaissance Festival. And the gentleman next to you... Uh, this is His Majesty the King. Hi, the king of the festival, and we welcome you here this day. Now, you have had a long reign, Your Majesty, if I remember correctly. You've been here a good 14 years as king. Ah, indeed. I've been quite fortunate to be here with the Renaissance Festival and uh, inviting all our guests to come and visit us every year. It's exciting. I'm assuming the king is a big draw, as are all the performers and the, the life that comes to life thanks yes, to the festival. Yes, the magic of the festival. Tell me a little bit about how all this came to be. How did, how did this Renaissance Festival become what it is today? Well, it started back in the 70s when our owner came down after recently selling the Minnesota Renaissance Festival. He bought a gravel pit here. He opened that first season with just a handful of stages and vendors throwing their blankets out on the open field and selling their wares off a blanket. Uh, had a big turnout that year and we just progressively grown and reinvented ourselves year after year to become the largest Renaissance Festival in the country. Now, and that's kind of an impressive thing, that the largest in the country. What do you gauge that by? Is it by attendance? Is it by performers, events? It's what? by all of those things. It's by attendance, it's by acreage, it's by performers, the number of performers we have, the number of booths we have, the number of shops we have, food vendors. And Your Majesty, over the years as things have changed at the festival, how has your role changed? Well, um, actually, that's what's nice about being king. My role really doesn't have to change. All I have to do is lord over and enjoy all the sights and sounds of the Renaissance Festival and uh, make sure that another half a million people come out and visit us this year, indeed. Interesting point you bring up. Half a million people visited half last year. Half a million people last year. You're expecting to break that record If this the year. weather holds, absolutely. Yes. The reason we're here isn't just because it's a great festival. You employ a lot of artisans and a lot of performers. Over 400 entertainers I personally employ every year. Okay, tell me a little bit. We'll talk about the performers in a minute. I want to know about the artists that are here. What are we going to find when we come out? You're going to find art, arts from all over the continent of Europe. I mean, you're going to find people who are specializing in Spanish wares and Italian wares and French wares. You're going to find glass blowers and blacksmiths. You're going to find armor makers, candle makers, wax chandlers. All sorts of professions are represented out here in the Renaissance Festival. And talk a little bit more about what they do, what kind of crafts you'll find here. If you were to come out here, who are some of the artists that impress you the most? Well, the glass blower is, is one of the best in the country. I mean, she's doing daily demonstrations and actually get to see actually how that craft is done. We have the, an actual copy of the Gutenberg Press here. Really? We do, and they actually have demonstrations throughout the day. So it's not just the wearers are there, they're also educational. Yes, they are, quite quite educational. Now over to your majesty. When we talk about all of these artisans that continue their craft because there are things like the Renaissance Festival, yeah. when it comes to performers, there are certain things, the jousts, the different things that these performers perform. The jousters who travel about, and I mean, that's an actual skill. Not only are they horsemen, and they have to learn the skills of becoming a jouster, yeah. I mean, they fall off daily off their <laughs> horses for our entertainment so indeed they're, they're very special uh, we have uh, Adam Kraft who's a Guinness Book of World Record holder for whips and he comes out here and performs with us and it does an amazing whip show and then in the evening he adds fire to it so it's just absolutely astounding the clan tinker a family circus and actually family circus much in the vein of the Renaissance or the medieval period who have learned uh, they juggle, they uh, walk on tightrope, ropes and they just have a huge show together that just entertains everyone of all ages. It's great because it's a wonderful exhibition of great art and also great performers and great things to see and arts to be entertained. There's music and there's dance and there's juggling and there's yep. all this stuff. It's just an amazing. This year what have you folks added in? What's new and fresh? We've completely rebuilt our globe stage. The globe stage was one of our original stages here. It had been around for 37 seasons. Well, we thank you for your time. Your Majesty, thank you for your time. Ah, uh, thank thee. If you're headed to Texas and want to learn more, visit texrenfest.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.